The world of photography is a wide one. If you go to an event like Photo LA, you'll discover that photography means a, a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and there's a tremendous range of interests. There's a, a disturbing wide range of interests, actually, if you go to Photo LA, and what photography means to those different people. I apply a very narrow niche within that, which is large format, fine art, landscape photography, large formats. Me at age 12, that was my next door neighbor, Rick Wade, who was 11, and my parents used to do something that I certainly as a parent would never do, and I think it would be a rare parent nowadays, who would drop us off at a trailhead, let's say Christmas vacation, Christmas in the winter. The, some of the major trails went through there, and um, agreed to pick us up five days later, 20 miles away. <laughs> Nobody had even dreamed of cell phones, of course, at this point. And I'm here to tell you about it. Um, but obviously it was an okay thing. But what we did, you know, there were about four of us who did this over and over between ages maybe 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Then it wasn't cool anymore to go to high school or to college. So I had to go off to Peru and cultivate a place that had a strong indigenous culture and history. And um, through a mutual friend who was a mountain climber, I ended up getting an offer of a job in this town that I mentioned earlier, Wankaio, in the mountains, where I taught English first and then went on to teach uh, social studies at ranks of the National University. And this is where the camera first came into the picture. I was 21 years old, and I didn't have enough money to fly to Peru directly, so serendipitously I took a bus to Mexico City and then a sidewalk. Uh, flea market like this and a blanket on the sidewalk. I bought a camera from a guy for $10. And the part that was so fortunate is that it turned out to be something that even then was a classic, a Kodak Retina 3C, which was pre-SLR, but it had a very sharp German lens and it was a worthy camera. It was very sturdy to pack around with. And I'm sure if I bought something less, I would have been less encouraged in the photography mic mode. So why is it so hard to make an exceptional landscape picture? Well, one thing, being the right, probably the, if you're technically competent, the single toughest thing is to be at the right place at the right time when light, form, and color come together. And that's what I've really been doing for 10 to 12 years, is traveling all around the country to try to be in a place where for a few minutes, light, form, and color come together to make a satisfying picture. Um, not, that's not enough, of course. You have to somehow isolate it inside of a rectangle. We're stuck with the tear in the rectangle and we're off the and then, even that is not enough. Um, you've probably heard it said that most beautiful scenes don't actually make beautiful pictures. Their pictures have their own rules. That we have a visual culture going back to the Renaissance that has conventions for pictures, and we're all sort of steeped in that. And there are ways that pictures work better than others to, to work at the level of a satisfying picture by itself. And uh, that kind of leads me to something that how many of you have heard of the journalistic photographer Cartier Bresson? and his concept of the decisive moment. If you haven't looked at his images lately, they're all, as you'll recognize them, they're iconic. I would do at least a Google image search. There are just remarkable pictures. He started in the late 40s. He's part of the, one of the founders of the Magnum Agency. For and I think if you appreciate those things and find them in the pictures, your viewers, your audience will too. And at some level, at least, I think you will inspire or at least rekindle people's belief in the intrinsic fundamental value of wild places. And if you're capable of doing that, you will help.